The Truex by Terry Burkett A warm day in June, way out on Oak Knoll, with my saw and my axe hung up on a pole. I was fixing a wheel on my board-flipping packer when I glimpsed what I thought was a green-chested quacker. I looked to the sky. That wasn't a bird. It looked like a green-chested man. How absurd. He was drifting along, just riding the breeze, when below him he heard the clink of my keys. Mister, he yelled with a whiskey wheeze. I'm guard bark, protector of the trees. With one squinted eye, he sized up my clothes, my axe, my saw, my steel-booted toes. Hello, Mr. Guardbark, I said with unease. And not to be rude, I got off my knees. He must have been flying for quite a long while. He seemed kind of sad, so I said with a smile, I welcome you here where the loblolly grows, and the roots of the shade grove tickle your toes, where the shrub bird sings and hums out his nose, and blue-breasted bark peckers peck out the rose. I'm Truax the logger. I harvest the trees for bats and for houses and for things such as these. Before I could shake or offer a seat, the guard bark stopped, stiffened, and stamped his two feet. Sir, he said loudly, you are grisly with greed. Cutting hag bark is mean, a horrible deed. Look what a mess your hacking has made. You did all of this just to get your bills paid? Not at all, I said with a smile. Have a seat on that pile. This might take a while. I won't take a seat or listen or look. The guard bark raved, he snarled, and he shook. I'm the guard bark, I tell you, keeper of trees. Our future, you know, depends on these. You must stop all this hacking and whacking and stacking. You should not be here. I must send you packing. Whoa, Mr. Guard bark. Just calm down a bit. Our trees won't be helped with a fumulous fit. Let's talk instead. As I've always said, talking is much better than losing your head. Okay, we'll talk. You brutish tree racker, turn off your saw and your wood hacker stacker. I turned off my saw and my stacker, and soon we could hear the shrill call of the leaf sucking moon. Then guard bark began, I am angry, all right. What future is there with no trees in sight? Trees clean the air, give shrub birds a rest. Fuzzy worms and kite squirrels use trees for their nest. Oh, Mr. Guardbark, you're right, I agreed. No trees for our future would be dreadful indeed. That's why I carry a bag of tree seed and my dirt-digging planter to plant them with speed. In fact, for every one tree that I need, I plant five food-stowing, tree-growing seeds. My friends do the same all over this land. Six million a day. It's part of the plan. Thirty-some years ago, just this past May, we had half of the trees that are growing today. We're working really hard to manage our trees, to keep lots of them growing and free from disease. Guard Bark pondered this last bit of news while chewing his fingernails off by the twos. You really plant trees? For the trees that you use? Still, that won't remove my tree-hacking blues. He looked rather gloomy there shaking his head. I guess he must have known the truth, so I said. Back in the thirties, with wildfires unchecked, millions of acres of forest were wrecked. Then people began to pitch in and fight. The fires that began from big lightning strikes. Now every year, 49 million acres of trees are spared from this lawless tree taker. Guard Bark muttered, cocked his head to one side, and rubbed his chin as he thought. Then he sighed. But what about trees that are really quite old, that are cooling our planet and shouldn't be sold? 
They're cleaning our air. It's really not fair to cut them down for some wobblesome chair. I realized Guardbark did not want to know how the earth keeps on changing, so I spoke sort of slow. With wildfires and winds, insect and disease, nature herself renews stands of rolled trees. I looked at Guardbark with his mouth turned to gristle. His eyes shot me darts. His nose whirled and whistled. But nature is patient and willing to wait. I want old trees now. The wait's what I hate. I agree with the guard bark that it always is good to save some of the old historical wood. Then I give him the facts, the truth of the matter. This guard bark did not want to hear idle chatter. We're teaching our people just how to conserve. And we've set aside land in national preserves. 95 million acres, to be quite precise, have been set aside just to look nice. Well, critters and plants do use this land. It just isn't used by woman or man. Now, breathable air. You've got a point there. We all need clean air. For that, there's no spare. But if we examine the scientist's rule, we see that plants clean air, and it's cool. Depending on young trees in the tree-growing school, that's where they learn how to use CO2 to make lots of oxygen. Really, it's true. I looked at the guard bark, the gleam in his eye. I knew we weren't finished, this entry and I. As soon as that thought was leaving my head, the guard bark spoke up, and here's what he said. Biodiversity! Now there is a word, a sciency frog birdie word that I heard. He thought for a moment, and then he went on. Will this still be here when the trees have been sawn? I like these discussions where views are debated, so I dug up my facts and quickly stated, Biodiversity, hmm, let me see. That word has a lot of good meanings for me. In each of our forests, critters abound. Leaf snatchers in treetoppers, leaf buggers aground. They're snacking and burrowing, packing and scurrowing. Their lives are always changing. It must be quite harrowing. Cutting the trees sends some critters running, but others move in, some cute and some cunning. They munch on the leaves, they grow on the bark, and none loves it more than the pink spotter lark. A newly cut forest has sun on the ground, and biodiversity leaps and bounds. All kinds of new species move in together. We're scales to warts, from fur to feathers. Then a great thing happened. It made me quite glad. The guard bark calmed down. He was no longer mad. His shoulders relaxed. Then he said with a sigh, We want the same thing, tree whacker and I. What about endangered species, my friend? How do we keep them from seeing their end? He looked quite concerned, so I knew he was through, being angry at me for the job that I do. I felt he must learn that I'm concerned too. I don't have all answers, but I gave him my view. That's a tough question. It takes a lot of thought to decide what we ought not do or what we ought. Would anyone mind if we lost, say, a tick, carrying a germ that would make the cuddle bear sick? Or what about something that's really quite nice? like the yellow-striped minnow that lives in Lake Zeiss. How far will we go? How much will we pay to keep a few minnows from dying away? Do we ever consider how it would be if we could never, ever again cut a tree? Would we live in houses made of plastic and steel till the oil and ore runs out, and they will? Then what would happen after a bit of time passes to the animals that live in shrubs and grasses? With no opening up of the dark forest floor, there'd be no more habitat for them anymore. 
You know, Mr. Gardbark, I've thought and I've dreamed. I've fumed and I've steamed and I've figured and schemed. I want the best future for my little boy. I want trees to be here for him to enjoy. With that, he looked at me straight in the eye. He shook my left hand and took to the sky. He said, I am the guard bark, ward of the trees, and I like the way that you're managing these trees. I'm glad that we chatted, conversed, and confide. I now think our views aren't quite so one-sided. And perhaps best of all, the guard bark beamed, I think things are not quite as bad as they seemed. The End <laughs>